thank you all for being here. Um, as you know, what we're going to talk about today is um, the changes in school over the last 50 or even 60 or more years. We have people, both uh, our presenters and in the audience, who can tell us about that. I hope that others of you will feel free to, uh, to join in. But we're going to start with a special treat from our young visitors. Um, something that you do in school every day, only they're going to do it in a special way because they're going to give us the Pledge of Allegiance in French to begin. That's wonderful. Do you want to talk about it, Miss? I think you said it. Did I say what needed to be said? I, I just would like to thank Ms. Areo and the teachers, Miss Stephanie, Miss Dejon, Miss Janelle, for allowing us this pleasure. And of course, we welcome our very special guest. You, you are our very special guest. And they started saying the pledge at Doja Elementary. And they're going to say it for us today. Now at Doja, all the children, kindergarten through third grade, say the pledge in French on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then in English the other three days. And I think Miss Janelle was one instrumental in starting the pledge in French. So we're giving her the honor of directing them today. Okay? Well, it was pretty close. Mm -hmm. In a P 
P-Roll. Right here. They provided her with a P-Roll, and every morning she paddled the P-Roll across the million Bayou and went to teach in this one-room schoolhouse. The parents of the children around there would bring them to school very early, and they would build a fire for heat, and they did all of the janitorial work with her. In other words, she was the principal, the teacher, and the janitor, all at one time. Well, this went on for a number of years, but at that time, the children learned their catechism in French, and she had learned to read and write French. So the parents asked if she could stay after school and teach them their catechism. At that time, they let them do this in the schools. So she taught them catechism in French, and then when they knew enough, she felt they brought them to Youngsville and they made their first communion. Before I go on with this, I just want to tell you that at that time, they were so appreciative of this. In my early years, when we lived out on the farm, these people that she had taught like this would bring eggs, corn, all kinds. That was how they thanked you. They didn't go buy a gift. They brought whatever their produce was on the farm. Well, anyway, this was, this was, she was 86 when I brought her to school. Needless to say, I'm going to say it again, they were not a bit interested in what I had to say when she finished. And this was brought in, sent by Uncle Venos' daughters. This was their mode of transportation, a horse and buggy. And that's my mother and two of her cousins there. Now, this Uncle Venos was a, a big promoter of education in the early 1900s, and I have a little story to tell about him. His great-grandson is now Dr. Daniel Dortes, who is the superintendent of education in the Midland Parish. And, and anyway, uh, she had to choose then between marriage and teaching. They could not teach school and be married. So she had to choose. I'm thankful that she did choose marriage. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she chose to be married, and so she had she quit this little job there. Now, I wanted to show you, in my <coughs> early years of schooling, my family moved to New Orleans because they were having a hard time with the living in this area, so he went to New Orleans, and this was in my preschool years, and I started kindergarten and first grade in New Orleans. Then we moved back to my grandmother Lewis, farm between Iraq and Delta. And I went to school in Delta for a year, and I went to school on this school bus. <laughs> it was new drawn. Now, I want to tell you about this. There were tarpaulins that they would lower when it was cold and rainy, and when the weather was nice, they would roll them up. And this was a dirt road now. No gravel, no pave, no, and nothing of that kind. And sometimes the, the bus would get bogged. And, and the boys would get out and they would push this bus and unbog it. But I'm going to pass these pictures around and you can look at them. And I would like to mention that this bus was owned by Mr. Illy Landry. And he did not want it, but they kind of pushed it on him. They gave him $40 a month for this, to run this school bus. His children ran it for him, but they would hitch the mules. When they got to school, they would unhitch the mules, and they would graze on the school ground. And in the afternoon, they would. <laughs> this Mr. A. B. Landry's son became assistant superintendent of schools. His name was Lazard Landry. He was assistant superintendent in the early 70s. And I, I keep thinking, maybe their association with the schools then may have had a little something to do with mm -hmm. these people furthering their education. I'm going to pass these pictures around so you can see them. Now, when I, after Delco, I went to LeBlanc School. This was a two-room schoolhouse. The principal there was also the principal, the teacher, the, the, the janitor. 
And we had a little classroom, not much bigger than this area. And here was fourth grade, here was fifth grade, here was sixth grade, and here was seventh grade. And all these classes we had to listen to. And sometimes when I was in the fourth grade, he would tell us, uh, you study your lesson. Well, instead of studying, I was listening to what he was saying on the other side of the room because I was more interested in that than, what, in, than to study my lesson again. Now, at that time, I, want, I know that recently I was in school and you took the Louisiana and California Achievement Test. In those days, they gave us a state spelling test. And then they gave us a certificate. This was in fourth grade, and the names of some people here that I want to mention. Mr. J. H. Williams was superintendent. This is a dictionary proficiency test that I'm going to talk about later. Mr. J. H. Williams was still the superintendent. And do you know what, do you know where his name is right now? There's a school name in his memory. It's J. What? Yes. J. H. Williams. Middle School is named after Mr. Williams. T.H. Harris was the state superintendent of education then, in the fourth and in the eleventh, okay? Well, he has, there's a scholarship that's given every year, a very good scholarship to seniors in his memory, and there's a T.H. Harris vocational school named after him. I, I, I'd like for you to it's understand. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, okay. This one, this dictionary proficiency test. Mm -hmm. This Ms. woman. Let's talk about the Leblanc school for a little bit and then come back to high school later on. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you want me to wait? Yeah, I want you to wait. I want, because I know other people but have stories about Before I sign up, I have to give pay homage to someone whose portrait is hanging right here. And I want to tell you that this young man was my role model when I was in school. And I want to talk about role models right now. Right now, I would like for you to pick some good role models. And I want to tell you what that is. A role model is someone older than you who is doing good instead of bad. This man was the most handsome, the most intelligent, the most athletic, he, all of the adjectives that I would want to say, I could not fill that in right now. And this, the reason why I'm mentioning him, he had, he was killed during World War II. He was a lieutenant in the Marines on a ship. And he influenced my whole life later on. I graduated from USL in, 19, I finished school in 1943 and I graduated in 1944. And after I graduated from high school, I received this letter. Dear Inez, I know you will be surprised hearing from me. I just received a copy of the Meridna and saw your name as a candidate for graduation. I wanted to take this opportunity to offer my congratulations. I feel certain that your success as a teacher will be, will continue as true to form as when you were a student. We in the field of education have a great responsibility to follow. I know you will carry on. I want you to know that through the years, when I became very discouraged at times and I had obstacles as a teacher, I would take this letter out and I would read, and the words carry on came strong to me. This is Snoopy Derwin. This is Snoopy Derwin. He wrote this letter to me. This was sent to me in 1944, and not long after I received this letter, he was killed in, uh, on the ship. They bombed his ship, and he was buried at sea. But I feel like he still lives on. Because you went to school there. I'm going to sit down because I see it stretching there. 
been fixed. I don't want you to get a quick in your head. I want to ask you one thing. When I say seven to nine, is that a high, high, high number? No. Uh -uh. <laughs> well, thank you. You made my day. I want to tell you. I go way back. I'm 79 years old, and I want you to know that that's a high number, and I go way back. Well, anyway, I was a little girl, and uh, when we started school, we were four, four, uh, four sisters started together. I was the youngest of the four. Well, we had to get to school. There was no bus, dirt road. So my daddy had a Model T Ford. You know what a Model T Ford is? My, the first Model T Fords didn't have a top on it, and it was a one seat. But by the time I started school and my sisters, it was two seats. So my daddy took the back seat off, and he built a bed out of wood. And that's how, he, instead of a bus, that's how we went to school. Every morning, he saw the little Model T Ford, you had to crank it like this, and go <laughs> And then we would all jump in the, little, in the bed of the truck, and we'd go down the road. Well, the first thing we did, we went in the dirt hole. Hmm, the car was stuck. We all got out of the truck, pushed the truck, got over the hole, got in the truck again. Sometimes we get to school, it was so muddy, they didn't know who we were. <laughs> well, anyway, and in those days, when we got to school, there was no ice water, nothing. It was a pump. You know what a pump is? You pump it like this, and cool water comes out of it. We all had each other a little cup. It was a little collapsible cup, and you would close it, and it would stand about this high. Then we had to bring our lunches. My, my mama, we each had our lunch bucket. It was a two-story lunch bucket. The bottom was the lunch, the top was what we had to drink. Well, there was certainly no refrigerators. Where do you think we kept our lunches? Well, in the ice chest? <laughs> in the cold <laughs> In those days. Yes, well, yes, we could have done that too, but you know where we kept it? The building was high. All buildings a long time ago were high off of the ground so the air could go underneath it and keep it cool because there was no air conditioning, or fans or anything, no electric lights or anything. So we would find a place under the building where the, the, the pillars were and we'd put our bucket behind the pillars underneath the schoolhouse and that way it would keep our lunch cool. And at noon, we'd all crawl out of the, the schoolhouse, get our lunch bucket, go out and eat it. I'm sure our hands were dirty. But there's no place to wash our hands. And we had outdoor toilets, and there was no flushing either. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and uh, I went to school there in first, well, I had low first, they called it low first, high first, instead of kindergarten like you have now. Then we went to first grade second grade, but then by that time they were building a gravel road. You know 339, the road that you take from 14 going to Lafayette? Well, that was all a dirt road. They started grabbing the roads. And you know what they have to work with? Not one machine to build that road. It was beautiful horses and strong horses. And they'd hitch it to a, a scoop. And they would scoop the dirt and throw it and build the road. The scoop, the dirt, throw it over, and they'd build the road that way. Then by the time they had the gravel road, they had a motor, they had a bus with a motor on it. This is Joe P. So we started going, uh, coming to school in Iraq. <coughs> it, was, it was too far to come in Iraq for my daddy to bring it. But then we transferred to Iraq in third grade. And I came and I graduated in 34. Then from then, I went to Southwestern. And in those days, the, the elementary teachers on there was a two-year course. Then later on, they added a three-year course and then a four-year course. But I started with a two-year, but I didn't finish until 37. In the summer of 37 is when I finished. Shall we, shall we have Ms. Ethel talk about her teaching? Because I want to sort of do the elementary, and then we'll move on to high school, because we really want to tell you about Ms. Barry. Well, I don't have okay. any real oh, interesting yeah. stories to tell, like but, the son is. But interesting that, that, sure. that, 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 yeah, that um, Inez Vesson and Evelyn Boudreau went to school at the LeBlanc School that was originally just a one-room school. And then just a little bit later, um, Ethel Kendrick taught, started teaching there. Was that your first No, teaching? I taught 6th, 7th, and 8th grade here. And 
I want to say this. I taught the same students for three years. We grew together. We, we did a lot of growing together. And we're still very good friends. That was really a wonderful experience. Well, by the time they were in the eighth grade, I had taught them everything I knew. They went to high school. <laughs> they left me behind. And they sent me to first grade at the law school. <laughs>
We climb down these stairs, and I walk back to the karate, where the karate school is to eat my lunch. We had one hour for lunch. Then after lunch, I walk back to school and climb these stairs. In the afternoon, I went down, and when I got home, I had some chores that my mother had lined up for me to do. We did not have physical education in the school. <laughs> we didn't need it. We did not have physical education in the schools. And I have to, I, I, I had started showing this, and I do want to, I do have so much before she talks. I want to tell you that this woman was my teacher when I was in high school. And, you were school. and she taught me from the ninth to the twelfth, she taught me English. And I, I, I have so much respect for her as a teacher. Her, this was a dictionary proficiency test that we took when I was in 11th grade. Now, in 11th grade, I became a senior, and I graduated from high school that year. There were only 11th grades then. Well, her name is on this certificate, and I really treasure this. Would you like to look at this, okay? Do you want to talk about some of your teaching? <laughs> Very was a wonderful teacher. These ladies are a hard act to follow. <laughs> but maybe there are a few more things that, that you would be interested in. When I came to teach in Iraq, it was in 1934. That was the depths of the Depression. You children don't know about the Depression too much, but, but uh, us older folks do. That was 62 years ago that I came here to teach, and I was 20 years old. So if you have good arithmetic, that makes me 82. And I've had an awful lot of very nice experiences many of them which were here, right here in, in, uh, in Iraq. The, the first year that I taught here, I taught uh, all three, all four sections of English. In fact, for all the seven years that I taught here, I taught all of the English in the whole high school, eight through 11. One year I taught biology, which I knew nothing at all about, <laughs> and I was the girls' baseball coach. And the girls tried hard to teach me the bat, but I never did. <laughs> these ladies speak about the language problem that we have. And you, you younger people don't remember, but uh, some of you older people remember Mrs. Webb mm -hmm. and Frances Moss and Hilda Sandoz and Electa Blanchet. Mm -hmm. They were the first and the second grade teachers at the, at the years that I taught here. And the first thing that they had to do before the children learned anything else was, as you said, they had to learn to speak English. Then after they spoke English, then they would learn to, to, uh, to read and write. And it used to fascinate me because right outside the, the window, the, the, the little girls would play the jump rope. And, and they, they, uh, they had little songs that they sang, and they sang them in French. And I can't speak French, but, but, uh, was, but there was one that, that I, 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 I can hear it, I can see it now. And they, they, uh, it was in the gravel right outside the door, and they played jump rope barefooted, and they jumped up and down barefooted in the gravel and sang, last night, the night before, 24 robbers came knocking at my door. And if you all remember that, yeah. 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 what he said to me, and this is what he said, ladybird, ladybird, fly away home. You all remember that? Yeah. yeah. I, that rings in my ears to this day. Uh, Inez has told you about the roads and, and the buses, but there was one thing about one of the buses that she didn't tell you. One of our buses was drawn by oxen, and it came from down below here in Prairie Gray. And, and the roads were, were thick mud in the middle, and nothing else but a, a wagon with, with, uh, drawn by oxen could, could come through. And uh, it was the first oxen I had ever seen, and I was fascinated with them. Have you ever seen an oxen? They're, they're remarkable. We had no cafeteria, and because it was during the de Depression, a lot of people had no money uh, at, at, at all, and some of the children were, were hungry. And when they came to school, uh, the, the kids that lived in town, as you did, went home for lunch. The ones who lived in the country brought their lunches, 
and some of their lunches were, were very skimpy and very poor. Uh, a lot of them brought little steam syrup buckets with cold rice with syrup poured over the, over the rice, and that was all they had. But those were the lucky ones because they had something. And then we had a group of, of, uh, of kids that came from down south here whose uh, parents had, had chickens, and they would bring raw eggs to school and trade them. There was a little store across the street from school, yes, and, and they would trade three eggs. They could, they could get a, a sandwich, which was called a launch. And, and, uh, <laughs> and with three eggs, they got a launch, and the launch was made with two pieces of dry bread with a piece of bologna or some other form of pressed meat.
flats, no, no scenery, no backgrounds, no curtains of any kind, just as the bad stage. But it did have curtains that did this, and so we were uh, able to, to work with, with that. Um, a lot of the teachers, when, 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 when I was young, were also young, and uh, we liked to play with the, with the students. And some of you have heard this story before, so I'll make it brief. But the first winter that I was here, we had, had a, a big snow, and snow is unusual, as you know. And, and uh, so a lot of the kids didn't come to school, and some of the teachers didn't. But some of us did, and when we got to school, it was such fun. We all went out in the yard and, and, uh, and played in the snow, and we threw snowballs, and, and we tried to build a snowman. And do you remember L. R. LeBlanc? <laughs> well, L. R. LeBlanc had a plank, and he was using it as a shovel to, to throw the snow with. And uh, he was throwing the snow on everybody and having a good time. And when he went to throw the snow on me, his hands had gotten too cold, and, and, uh, and so he dropped the plank. And, and that when, the, when the snow came, plank and all, he got me right in the face and knocked me out cold. <laughs> Well, of course, they thought I was dead. <laughs> and they all cried because they thought I was dead. <laughs> then when I woke up and they found out I wasn't dead, they cried because I wasn't dead. <laughs> but but it, we had a great time. And I, I had some pictures of that. And, and I got them out, and they were all curled. And I have gotten them out and pressed them under some encyclopedias and to, to bring to show you. And I walked them. I can't find them anywhere, and I have all of those kids sitting on the on the, uh, the steps that lead up to the little L. All along, B. D. Broussard, remember her? Yes. Uh, uh, J. Roy Leblanc, O. J. Manuel, and Henry Bernard, uh, a big Lula. Mm -hmm. Rufus. 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 Uh, in those days, people weren't worried about religion in schools. You know how, how now you see on television how they uh, people are, 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 are taking other people to court and having all kinds of fusses about prayer in school. It wasn't like that in those days. We, not all of us were Catholic. I was not. But, but uh, when we had a mission, We'd all go across the street and, and uh, let school out and go to school with friends across the street and, and go to the mission. And uh, well, we had some good missionaries. I remember well, one of them was, was uh, uh, he was a, a wonderful missionary and, and he made us all feel so good. He, he, he told us that, I can remember that, and that was 60 years ago, but, but I remember it like it was yesterday. He told us that if we would just try a little bit harder how good we could be and how much good we could do for the world. It made us feel great. And then the next one, the next year, it was so full of fire and brimstone, he scared us all the way. <laughs> 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 but uh, but uh, in, in the course of the years that I taught in the Iraq, I, I taught a lot of different subjects, and, and, and I en enjoyed them all. Um, English, of course, was my very favorite. Not all the things that we had were bad at all. We had a lot of good things. In particular, we, we had a, a lot of young teachers who were very enthusiastic, as your teachers are. And we had some good kids. And we didn't have to worry about dope at school, and we didn't have to worry about school and all that kind of thing. And in addition to that, we had very, very cooperative parents and patrons. And, and uh, it's, it's been a long time, and in 82 years, I've done a lot of things, and I've seen a lot of things, and some of them were good, and some of them were bad. But I'm very happy that I had those seven years that I had with all of you here in Iran.
Well, in the third, uh, third is we were the Gophers. Gophers, Gophers went out of the Yes, yeah. back in the Golden late thirties. Golden Gophers. Snooky had selected that. Because of Minnesota. Right, because he loved Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> now, Gophers, Gophers. But what constitutes a Gopher? Well, you know, it's just a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Well, you and we had a lunch, provided the dogs hadn't gotten to it. <laughs> 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 I have to tell you something about this lunch business that Mr. John is talking about. My mama made delicious lunch, and I had a friend, and she loved to come home and sleep because my mama would fix a lunch for her to bring to school the next day. So sometimes she'd say, she said, let's eat your lunch. And uh, you come eat with me at noon. She'd live in town. I said, okay. So she and I would sit down and we'd share the lunch. And at noon, we'd go, we'd walk to her house and to eat. But she had a sister that was very mean. And she'd meet by the door and she'd do all kind of things and scare me to death. So I would sit on the steps. She would go in and eat a not a good lunch and I had nothing to eat. <laughs> You all spoke of your own school. When did ERAF, what year did ERAF have a school? What, did these people go to LeBron that lived around no, here? No, no they, they were just the people over there. Okay. They didn't have the high school here. They had a, a Burkettese first, and then they had another school uh, on, near the bayou up there, on, on, on top of a lumber yard. Uh, Pibby, right next to. Uh, the Dronets, they were Mr. Dronets. Yes, it wasn't far from the bayou. And when my, my husband went to school there, and when the teacher was teaching, she had a bathroom. They would slide down the rope, and the first thing she knew, all the boys had gone, they had all gone to the bayou, they were swimming. <laughs> and they'd tell her, don't come because we have no clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it was in 1925. When oh, it was back right there, yes. I, I would like to know one of those. We didn't uh, mention this. I started this. school in 1925. Oh, the years we're talking about, even when I was in high school, it was not compulsory to go to school. Hmm. Going to school was a privilege. You were lucky if you could go to school. But you didn't have to go to school at all. Then. Did you know that? Huh? I'm the reason that children didn't get an education in those days because they had no way of transportation. And therefore, they just didn't go to school. They had to walk too far. When I taught third grade, I had some children in third grade that were almost as, as tall as I am. I went to a funeral the other day, and the girl on the board said her age was 79, and that's my age, and I taught her. So I told her sister, I said, well, there's no way. She said, well, we lived in the country, and I'd never gone to school. So then they, when they started school, they were way old, mm -hmm. and therefore, that's why she was my age. And she was just in third grade. Mm -hmm. Some children had, had to work. work. Some children, yeah. you know, they had to work on the farm. They, they had to not many people had the opportunity to graduate. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first year that I taught here, as I said, I was 20. And, and Big Lula Mars was in my, my senior class, and she was 21. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and there was an election that year. And, and, uh, do you remember what your salary was uh, when you first started? Oh, yes. Do you remember? I meant to tell that. What was uh, my, my first year here? I made eighty-five dollars a month for nine months. And and uh, and I paid Francis Moss five dollars to bring me here in the car, and I paid Miss Miss Walter Moss five dollars a month for my lunch. So that left me seventy five dollars. And then I had borrowed money to go to, to LSU because my father had lost his job, and he had three of us in college at the same time. And I had worked, I waited on tables and washed dishes for my school for my senior year, and and uh, and so I paid ten dollars a month back on my on my loan. So what what I got. Was, was $65 a month for nine months. It was fortunate that I lived at home 
Who would like that? <laughs> well, my salary, I started $65 a month. And two years before that, my sister was teaching. They didn't have enough, school, enough money to close out the school year to pay the teachers. So they gave them a script. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you held your script and they had money, you could uh, you'd get the whole value of your, your script. And if not, you'd lose 10%. So my daddy picked up the script and he held it and then gave my sister her money. And uh, so luckily it was just one year, but Mr. Whitty would not sell a piece of property in the Midian Parish for anything in the world. And the teachers went along with it. They were willing to do this. And up until today, we are one of the very few parishes that still has all the property that was ever dedicated to Bar School. We, that's why we have all this oil property, marsh land, and farm property that, that are that's rented out because of Mr. Williams. When I started teaching in the war time, Second World War, you, you taught during the war, you did join it. Mm -hmm. It's war time. And one of my most vivid recollections is this. Well, let me back up a little bit. We had a prisoner of war camp in Taplin. All the Germans that were captured were put in prisoner of war camp. And we used to walk to school, as Ms. Arnett said. And I can remember walking to school in the morning, and this big truck, you know, like a big cane truck, would go by with these prisoners in it, under armed guard, taking them out to the field. And these men looked so sad. They would look at the little children, you know, walking. And I imagine they were thinking of their little children. But they were well treated in our camps. They got they got things that we couldn't get. Things were rationed, like gasoline was rationed. Miss uh, Barry says the teachers came in one car. The ones from Abbeville would come in one car because gasoline was at a premium. And sugar, shoes, stockings, coffee, coffee, coffee. Yes. It reminds me of something that I should, I, I feel I should share. I was a home economics teacher, and every summer I worked in the, in the canning center for a month after school was out. And the, the people would bring their sausage and chickens, and we canned it in these cans. And we mail, the, 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 the parents would mail that to their sons. I was a recipient of one from my grandma Alicia. <laughs> we canned those to send out, and I would every year I would spend a month in this canning center helping with all of this. Where was it located? In the school. It's right near the school. At the school. I have one other question. Yes. I'd like to know uh, how long did it take about? for the young children who could not understand English yeah. to be able to understand or not to start writing and, and reading. Mm -hmm. well, would it take a year? Would it take to oh, understand no, no, no. Did they learn faster? Did they learn faster? And read at the end of six weeks. She she that quickly? Reading. But learn? it was reading okay. words at first and reading a lot of the about pictures. Okay. Well, after six <laughs> weeks, they learned to start the how to give the yeah, books they and they start reading. Yeah. Yeah. They, like Ethel said, they really learned fast. Yeah. Well, it depends on the child. Yes, uh, right. Yes. yes. Did, did any of you ever hear Miss Webb's little story? Do you remember Miss Webb's little story about the little children? At the beginning of the year, she had them stand up and she said, say one on it. Do you remember that little story? And they all said, one, and smiled. And she said, say two. And they all sat down. <laughs>
My first, my first three words in English was a lie. They taught me five years, uh, six years old, and I wasn't six years old. I was five. Because you couldn't start school before you were six. Six years old. Thank you for the little children uh, experience I had. Mrs. Red knows how much I love signs, and. Uh, one year, I had a great big fish bowl, uh, and uh, we were, our readers, when we taught school, we had a whole unit, and it was about real things, like about the honeybees. Well, we would go, Mr., uh, there was a man that had a bee farm, so we'd get on the bus and we'd visit the bee farm, and the man would show us how he after the honey, he would let us taste the honey, and he would give us a piece of the honeycomb. And, uh, but this was, it was uh, about a tadpole, the frog of the tadpole. So I told the children, I said, anyone has a, a, I said to where they could get some water and some tadpoles. And one looked, I said, oh yes, ma'am. Well, the next day he came in with a bucket load. So we took the little things and we put them in the fish bowl. And we had to use the same water, otherwise the, the town water would have killed them. So we put all the water in there. It was kind of dirty, but that, that was that went with it. And then they brought some of the lilies and stuff, and we planted that inside. And there was already some little, you know what a tadpole is? Yeah, it's it it comes, awesome. Yes, it comes from the eggs. A, a mother frog lays the eggs. And then when they hatch, it's a little tadpole. It's a little black, black thing. It has a little tail and a big head and two eyes, and that's it. So <clears throat> we watch we watch it develop and watch it develop and one day one of them started having hind legs. The hind legs come out first and the tail was getting shorter. By the time it got a little bit older, the front feet came out. And then by that time there was no more tails. Well one morning and they just had oodles of them. One morning we get to school, Miss Ethel would have liked to have been there. There's little Greek frogs all over, all over the books, all over the tables, all over everywhere. And we were so excited and then we learned but we don't hurt them because they help us. So we got some sheets of paper and put the little frogs in and we'd go to the blender and push them out so that they would live to be able to eat the insects and to help us. Oh, we had a lot of experience like that. And one year, Mr. Sreer was the principal then. We had, it was homecoming. And we had studied about different uh, textures. So we had sugar under one, we had salt under one. And uh, I wanted some butterfly eggs. So I went to, uh, to where well, my son lives in the country. And my daughter-in-law and I sat there. And there was a butterfly and it was flying around and flying around. We were watching to see where it would land. All of a sudden, the butterfly comes and it landed a beautiful butterfly. And we wouldn't take our eyes off of the leaf. And the, our butterfly laid the eggs and laid the eggs and, and it flew away. And we went right straight to the plant and we got the leaf. And sure enough, there was all the little eggs. So we bring the little eggs to school the next morning, put them under the microscope. And every day, the children couldn't wait to get to school to look at the microscope to see if there was something. One morning, something was moving. It happened to be the day of homecoming. And the children were so excited to bring their parents and tell them all about everything that was under there. And when they got to the microscope, well, the parents were excited too because they could see something moving. Well, this was on a Friday. You get to school on Monday morning. It was not anything. We thought we'd get caterpillars because eggs from butterfly has a caterpillar. We thought we'd get caterpillars. They didn't have but one caterpillar. But they had a jillion of little turtle, uh, uh, what do you call those little bugs? Ladybugs. Yeah. All, all over, all over the table. They had about a hundred. Well, that was another good science lesson. I said, well now, what does ladybugs do? Do they help us? We went out with a science, I had a table full of science book. We went to them. We found what the ladybugs did. And we found out we certainly don't hurt them. So here we go again with the papers, and we pick the little ladybugs across on the, on the paper. We'd go and we'd put them out in the bushes, and we would treat them just like little bitty babies, because we just didn't want to hurt them. So we had two good lessons in one day. Oh, I have an experience in science. I have a question. Yeah, I'd like to have uh, an answer from the four teachers there. 
do you personally think that the fact that you stopped the kids from speaking French at school, it helped them to understand English or speak English better? I want a yes or a no from the four of you. And then we can discuss it after if you want to. May I tell you my feeling about that? Said yes or no. <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> it may be a more complicated answer. I know, okay. but I, I mean, think they'll, they'll tell you. Repeat that again. <laughs> Do you personally think that by stopping the kids from speaking French at home or at the school or wherever, help them to learn English better? No. 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 So you all agree with that. Right. But why did you do it? Because we were made. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. you can affect the language. Because they would have not been French, they would have spoken English, and they would not have to do that. I think it helped. I would like to say that. But they were ordered to do that in Canada, too. And we still speak French. I went to school in French up to grade 8. I learned English in grade 9. And I went to college in French. Then I had a bachelor in French. I went to Florida State University, and they thought I was not going to make it because I had a bachelor in French. Well, I graduated at Florida State University with distinction, a thing that I didn't do in French in Canada. So, I mean, this, this, this is it. Well, that would I okay. never know whether it did or not because of that. I would like to tell you that my, my sons have and my granddaughter all learned French very, very well. But that grandfather did not speak English, and they spent a lot of time with him. A lot of the parents just started speaking English, and they left the French That's out. That's right. You understand? So, but in my case, they, it was out of self-defense. They learned it because he did not speak a word of English. Well, my children did the same thing. They liked to speak French, but my mother-in-law lived there just for 30 years and did speak a word of English, so they learned to speak, which it was an advantage to them. And I told them for the time they were born, speak French. I didn't want that broken English. And uh, they both learned to speak French. In fact, they never took French in high school, but when they went to college, they took it. They really enjoyed it. They took it as electives. And they really enjoyed taking the English courses. But uh, they both learned to speak French, did they? Not too. But they understand it. I have two degrees. And I can't speak with one English, one one language, language. And, and I don't feel very smart. Oh, how many of you, your true. grandmother, speak French? Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. That's that it. Make your grandmother <laughs> speak <laughs> with you. What about their mothers and dads? That's beautiful. How many of your mom and dad speak French? She says, well, that's wonderful. Speak French with them and learn it. Oh, that's such an advantage. <laughs> I want to say something. This is by far the best lesson that I have had in a long time. I have really enjoyed you sharing this with you, with us. And I want to tell you something. Dr. Dortes called this morning, and he told me to tell you he had planned on being here, but he thought it was earlier today. He had to take his wife to um, New Orleans for 3 o'clock for a doctor's appointment. So he said to please thank you for sharing all of that information. He said that's how you keep the history alive. So he, he sends his regards. But we need to go to get the little children on the bus. But I have thoroughly. Excuse me. Can I tell them before we leave? We hope you bring the children to Mr. Uh, Rayo was in high school when I was teaching, and he was such a good student. Yes, he was. I don't know where I'd get a tape. Oh, that's the Thank you so much. I know that the more I was in the case, Mrs. Rayo.